Good evening, everyone. If you could please join me in a silent meditation, if you could sit straight in your chair with your feet flat on the floor and relax your shoulders. Please join me in Gasho. Namo Mirabutsu. Namo Mirabutsu. Namo Mirabutsu. Namadats, Namadats, Namadats. Okay, everybody could please join me in chanting the Jusei Gay. The PDF has been provided, and if you have the service book, it is on page 55. Gagon cho se gan ishim jodo shigan pumanzo se fu josho gak ga Good, 
ग सौक श तौक हो गेस जो मान थोक ए संगा योब मे सदाच मी पशो गांगा खे सायशो सो शे गो खा दैसन ओ खांडो कोक शो थे Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another Dharma Breeze Wednesday. I don't know about you, but it just seems like time is flying. I can't believe that it's going to be June just in a few days here. Um, I had I was talking to Michael before we had service and. Uh, we had Memorial Day on Monday here, and obviously most of the temples will go to the cemeteries and do services uh, for those on Memorial Day, not only for the veterans, but also for other people from uh, the Japanese American and Jodo Shinshu community. And it was interesting for me yesterday because, uh, and, and when I was serving Central California, we had 13 cemeteries to go to. Thank goodness for the minister's assistance, we'd have to make assignments and send people to the different cemeteries. But here, uh, in New York and Queens has the oldest Japanese uh, cemetery uh, on the East Coast, and it was dedicated in 1912. And so I went there and I'm really glad that I have some Japanese understanding because the whole thing was done in Japanese. So myself and Reverend Isabel Stamper, we were there and uh, we did things in English, but everything else was in Japanese. They're wearing black suits. I felt like I was in Tokyo and very, very formalized. But it was wonderful to see that people were there remembering those loved ones that had passed on. And at the, at the Cedar Hill Cemetery here in New York, also in Queens, uh, there's a columbarium that uh, the Buddhist Church of New York uh, had put in about 1957. And it has 150 notches. Um, and so it's just shelving units, but when you do, it's the main headstone. So it was very special to have people come and to honor those that loved ones that had passed on. Uh, the weather did not cooperate for us. I think the weather you have in Virginia today is what we had on Monday. We had storms. The power went out. My, the yoga blew off the table. It was very dramatic. So poor Isabel is holding everything down while we were chanting. So, but uh, again, as, as many of you know that, you know, I moved here to New York in only of September of last year. And many times I've exper shared experiences that are very interesting and different. And um, I had my first run in with celebrity here at the New York Buddhist Church. So it was Tuesday afternoon and I had an appointment to meet a couple for a wedding. 
ceremony that they want to have, or we're talking about the potential of a wedding ceremony. So they come there early uh, and they come in the door, probably 70-ish, I would say the age was, and she looked really familiar to me. And I'm like, oh, I, I couldn't place the face. I mean, obviously I wasn't thinking about who it was. And so we're standing there and they were very gracious and she was very bubbly and very charming. And so I handed them the paperwork, you know, you know, what names do you want to have on the forms? And so she says, oh, what name should I use, honey? And she was joking with her fiance. And it turned out to be uh, Bernadette Peters, the famous actress and singer who I liked for many years. Actually, I have a confession. I had a crush on her when she did The Jerk with Steve Martin. I was in high school and I had such a crush on her. And here we are. Uh, you know, 35, 40 years later. And she, the nice thing I can say about her is that what you see on stage is how she was. She's just smiling and joking and it was wonderful. And I asked because obviously neither of them have been I, identified as Buddhist. And again, uh, as the clergy, we say, you know, why are you sure that you want to have a Buddhist service and do you have any stipulations? And she said, um, well, I really liked that Dharma talk you gave. And I'm like, well, oh, which one? Because she was watching it on Zoom. And so Gary, Reverend Gary actually was the one that gave the talk, I guess, uh, on video, all Caucasian guys kind of <laughs> look alike. I was at Seabrook at that time. And what he did was that he had read a quote uh, about animals that Reverend Hosen Seki uh, wrote in his book. Now, some of the of you that might not be familiar with Reverend Hosen Seki, he's the person, the minister that founded the New York Buddhist Church. Hoshin Seki, that's his daughter, only child. And so she was born and raised in the temple at its original site. Where we are now, this property was purchased in 1958, I believe. So the original church was a few blocks north, excuse me, south, and got destroyed um, when they did urban renewal. So we moved into this fabulous building that we're in now. And, and so, so that Reverend Seki wrote a book and it was published. And she was so impressed with the talk. She actually pulled out her phone and had uh, Reverend Gary's talk on her iPhone. And she started quoting it. And so it was very beautiful words. And so after we had the wedding consult, I, I contacted Reverend Gary and I said, what is the quote? And this is not in the context of what we're going to be talking about tonight per se, but I would just like to share this quote because this publication has been long out of print and it's a beautiful idea about uh, the true sentient nature of all beings, whether we're animals or we're humans. And, um, and this is what brought Ms. Peters to the church because she's actually a great animal, animal advocate. She actually helped found a foundation here in New York every year that they have fundraising for. So I just like to share these words of Reverend Secchi that he wrote down many, many years ago. In this world, it is very difficult to be selfless. But when we truly understand the teachings of the Buddha, then we recognize the truth of Shinran Shoni's statement that all sentient beings are my father and my mother. Let's see why this is so. When we meditate on the true nature of the universe and every sentient being, we realize that the Buddha said that all life is oneness. Oneness is all. So when, we, so when we do not and cannot live alone, and when we pass away from this world, we enter the infinite life and light. This life and light is not discriminated. It is not my own life, and it's not my own light. It belongs to all sentient beings. Even the air exemplifies this. It spreads all over so that the air that we are breathing is here is the same as the air that's breathed in Africa, Asia, and Europe. All sentient beings are living in the same condition. This is the teaching of the Buddha. And every sentient being will be enlightened, not just humans, but cats and dogs, birds and fish, and all my brothers and sisters. It's a very powerful statement, isn't it? And I can understand uh, with Ms. Peter's background why that really struck a chord with her. And actually, she's asked me to read this uh, during the wedding ceremony. Uh, and I will honor that. And she asked if she could bring her dogs. And I said, okay, if you want to. But uh, but when I read things like all these wonderful treasures that we have hidden away in our temples, like this book probably has been out of print for 80 years, and the wonderful sentiment that still reaches. And I give him credit because he was very good at talking about the universality of everyone, especially considering that he wanted to bring the Dharma of Jodo Shinshu to New York City. 
But getting back to the idea of the couple, uh, it, it, interestingly enough, any of you that know Ms. Peters, she lost her husband in 2005. Um, and this is her second marriage, and she's marrying uh, her sound producer, who's been working with her for 35 years, which was nice because they had a nice relationship that eventually turned romantic. And so I said, well, why do you want to have the service here? And she smiled and said, well, we're not particularly spiritual. We're not religious, but we're spiritual. And I know in this group, um, in the sessions, we have talked before about the difference in what people's perception of religion is, which I think usually a lot of people think of as being institutionalized, and spirituality being what you have in your own heart and mind about a, a teaching. And so she said, yeah, because her other wedding was at a different Buddhist temple here in New York. I wasn't familiar with the name. And she says, but we want to be in the sacred space. And so I took them into the Hondo, the Oneijin area, and they were very impressed and decided that they wanted to have this private wedding there. So then to be respectful, uh, I you know, talk about what we do for the ceremony. And I don't know if many of you probably, unfortunately, not had the experience of participating or seeing a Jodo Shinshu wedding. It is absolutely beautiful. It's very simplistic. And so what I wanted to convey to her is that, as we've talked before, that our school of Buddhism, Jodo Shinshu, is a householder form of Buddhism designed for us to hear the teachings and to incorporate into our daily life. And as the ministry here for the Buddhist churches of America, um, what I, again, another book out of print, they have what they call the Seiten or the Kai Kyoshi Seiten. Kai Kyoshi means that I'm a foreign missionary. I've told you that before. Even though I'm American and I'm serving my own country, I am technically a foreign missionary from Kyoto. That's what my Wagesa is for. So I'm Kai Kyoshi. And so they give you this book. And it's about this thick, and you go through it, and it's all these aspirations. And a lot of these aspirations we don't necessarily do. Um, again, the idea is, is that with the idea of uh, upaya or hoban of teaching the teachings of the Buddhist teachings so people can understand at their level, there are services that we normally don't do. Uh, I did a housewarming service, uh, which is something that's done in Japan. Uh, a lot of people think, oh, this is to get... The, the evil spirits away or to clear out. And I, I've done more than one of them and there's a reading that you follow. But then what you're encouraged as a minister is to bring into the conversation, well, why are you having the service? What is the meaning for you? And then hopefully you'll be able to bring in the Dharma content, the spiritual content. Uh, and again, for the wedding, I wanted to make it clear that you know this is a Buddhist service. Uh, even though I really like the couple, if they said, oh, we don't want any chanting or we don't want any Buddhist element, I would have to say, I'm sorry, I cannot do that service or utilize the temple out of respect for the Buddhist tradition. Fortunately, I've not had to deal with that personally, uh, where people usually are okay. Now, when we do the service, like I said, as being a Buddhist in our everyday world, being a secular person, what you're doing is you're doing two components to it. The first component is that you are wedding the couple. And, and again, uh, many of you are very well aware that BCA was one of the first organizations to have same-sex marriage in the United States going back to the 1970s. So whomever the couple is, is that what you're doing is you're obviously by legal law, you are combining them into a form of marriage. But and most importantly, and this is what I wanted the couple to hear, is that what we're doing is that you're also reaffirming you're wanting to live by the Buddhist ideals. And so for those that haven't seen the service, you know, you wear the formal robes and you have the chuke, which is the big, beautiful fan. And then what you do is that you open up the fan and you put it in front of the couple who are facing you. There's an incense burner and they put the rings on it. And then you turn around with your back and there is the altar or the myogo. And then you do a chant that many of you probably haven't heard, which is sad because it's one of our more beautiful chants. And then you turn around. So what you're doing then is then there is wedding onenju. So onenju are the Buddhist remembrance beads. And uh, so in the BCA bookstore, you can buy a wedding set where it's a his and her. And then of course, in modern world, we've had to mix those sets up if it's the same gender couple. But what you're doing, which is very beautiful and very symbolic of the Buddhist teachings, is that you are giving them the onenju first. And so what I will do is I will take the Onenju and I'll go over the incense and they're standing there in Gasho. And then you put the Onenju on. And then what the Buddhist component of the service is, is that there is what we call the Hyobyakumon. Uh, for those that aren't familiar with the Japanese term, 
uh, like when we do a special service, like if we're doing Hanamatsuri, uh, usually the, the the speaking person in the Onaijin will do a reading. That's the Hyobiakumon. And I thought I'd share the Hyobiakumon from the wedding ceremony for you to have a maybe a clear understanding of the joining not only in matrimony, but also with the Buddhist ideas. It says, we are gathered today in the presence of Amida Buddha with deepest reverence and ad adoration in our hearts to bring in together to harmony. And then you mentioned the couple's name. May this couple be lastingly true to their vows, love and respect each other and help each other in stress and woe. Keep themselves pure in mind and body and encourage each other in the promotion of all virtues. And then they say the Nembutsu. And then I turn back to the, the, the people that are in attendance of the service and I say, and this is the, the quotation, and no one has asked me to change this, even if the, it's a dual wedding, like if it's one of the family has is from a Catholic background or Jewish background. It says, thus spoke the Buddha, the greatest happiness that a mortal man can imagine is the bond of matrimony that binds two loving hearts. But there is a greater happiness. It's the embracement of truth. Conditions may separate husband and wife, but conditions will never affect a person who has embraced the truth. Therefore, be married unto the truth and live with truth and holy wedlock. The husband who loves his wife and desires for a union that should be everlasting shall be faithful to her, to be like truth itself. She will place her trust in him and she will respect him. The wife who, like her husband, and desires for a union that shall be everlasting must be faithful to him to be like truth itself. He will place his trust in her and respect and honor her. With these words of blessing together, the teacher is your guiding light in your marriage. May you, with these words of the blessed teacher, gather and light in your marriage. And then you say, do you take this person as your husband? Do you take this person as your wife? And then you announce them as a couple. So you realize that we're doing this and it's very beautiful symbolic. And I'm smiling because there's uh, Chris Lavavino at the bottom and he is, he and Chris Jennifer were my first wedding couple. So I, they, I went through this with them and I messed up Christopher's last name, the whole service. I call, didn't call him Lavanino. But getting back to the service. So what they're doing is you're standing there and you're standing in Gasho. So it's a Buddhist service. And then what you're doing is you're saying that they're affirming that they're going to have this marriage and they take the vows with the idea that they want to be truth like themselves and to follow the Buddhist teachings. Then the service continues on where I turn around and I've got the chuke or the big fan and I've got their wedding rings and like a traditional wedding, then they put the rings on each other. And then, uh, you know, you turn around and pronounce them husband and wife or whatever terminology that they want to use. And so it's a beautiful service. And then we also do uh, something where we bond the families together, the sakudo service where you've got the, the, it's not the container with the sake and the family pours and shares that. And so what it's doing is not only bringing symbolically the, the husband and wife or the two, the couple together, but what it's doing is it's bringing the family, you're connecting to the bonds to both sides of the family and saying that we are now part of the same family. I'll be very honest, that is, is based in a Shinto belief, but it's not contradictory to the Buddhist teachings and it does give a lot of uh, symbolism to the families that are joining, re reflecting that it's not just the couple that are married. So as you can see, you know, as I brought up the idea, because obviously I, the wedding plans were very prominent when I met with the couple earlier this week. And I realized that as a minister that, you know, we do things that a lot of the Sangha is not aware of. How do we take when we meet people in their everyday life, how do we try to incorporate the Buddhist ideals? How do we try to make it relevant for those people? And so whether it's the housewarming ceremony or whether it's a wedding ceremony, uh, whether it's a funeral or a makarakyo where we go to the deathbed where someone has passed away or is about to pass away, is that what we try to do is infuse the situation with the Dharma and give encouragement and warmth and comfort. I won't go into detail because I've spoken before about our makarakyos or our pillow services, but it's such a rewarding uh, service to observe. And again, you know, you get called at any time, day or night, traditionally, in California especially, and you go to where the family is. It could be in the ER, it could be a very unpleasant situation, or it could be someone's home. Or, And what you do is that you start a service. And what you do is you talk to the family. 
how are you doing? What's the situation? What's going on? And usually people are pretty sober. Obviously, some their loved one has just passed away and is there. And then what you do is you have the keen, which is the bell. And when you ring the bell and you do a short chant, you do the jusege, and the tears start coming. It opens up the dam for them. They hear the teachings. They hear the sutra. And interestingly enough, and I'm sure Eric has experienced this too, is that even if the person is on their deathbed, it might not be present, meaning unconscious, when you start chanting, you can tell that they hear the chant. That's why you try to do the service, the chant, while the person's still alive, because symbolically, it's their way of hearing the sutras for the last time. But whether the person is still with us or not, what it does is an immediate release for people that my loved one is not here, but the Buddhist teachings are here to guide and protect us. When I was the resident minister at Akoji 10 years ago, I only did one pillow service, uh, and that was at a hospital in Fairfax. And it was a Korean family. Uh, and uh, the, the daughters were Korean American, but mother was Korean. And father, interestingly enough, they were Buddhist, Zen, Chan Buddhist from Korea. And he had a simple operation and their monk told him that, oh, don't worry, he's gonna make it through the surgery. He did not. And they were so upset with their monk that they called us. So I go there and again, trying to explain what I do. And the daughters were translating into Korean. And I said, well, I do the, I'm from a Japanese denomination, being respectful. Is that going to be offensive to your mother because of the war and the occupation of Korea by the Japanese? And she says, no, it's okay. And so then I start chanting and none of the family understood a word I was saying. And again, the tears started coming. And it was closure for the family. And the family said, thank you very much. So again, as householder Buddhists, it's so important for us to try to remember to incorporate the Dharma in every aspect of our life. In sad times, as if when someone passes away, or as in a joyous occasion, like doing a wedding where you're starting off, or the infant presentation service where you're introducing the child to the Sangha for the first time. So thank you very much for listening tonight. I think we've got some things to talk about. Um, we can talk about uh, the quotation, and if people are willing or interested in that, I can send the PDF to Michael. Maybe he can redistribute it, because I read half of it. It's longer than that. Um, so what I'd like to do now is I'd like us to do a group reading together. So if you could please join me and Gasho and read together our pledge. Breaking out of my shell, I will share a warm smile and speak gentle words just like the kind Buddha. Not becoming lost in my greed, anger, and ignorance, I shall think and act with an open mind, just like the calm and peaceful Buddha. Not putting myself first, I will share in joy and sadness of others, just like the compassionate Buddha. Realizing the gift of life I have received, I shall strive to live each day to its fullest, like the Buddha who tirelessly works to liberate all. Namo Amida Butsu. Namo Amida Butsu. Namo Amida Butsu. Okay, and just before we go into the discussion, I would like us to do another quick, short sitting meditation, please. So again, you can sit straight in your chair, feet flat on the floor, and relax your shoulder and put let your glaze down.
Please join me in Gasho. Namo Mirabutsu. Namo Mirabutsu. Namo Mirabutsu. Namadas, Namadas.